well, so definitely keep her in your prayers. Uh, Wyatt Herndon is not feeling well, so I talked with him today, and he is just still in a little bit better, but he's still out of it, so keep him in your prayers. Uh, and other business, um, starting the, ver the first Sunday of September, the Ward Supper Cups will no longer be behind the seats in the pews. They will be in one of two places. There will be a basket uh, under the table on the mirror, on the table under the mirror, and also one underneath the clock in the foyer. Uh, also, there is going to be a work day here at the building on August 26th, which is a Saturday at 9 a.m. Uh, and then also, we need someone to sign up to mow uh, the lawn for September, and also someone to fill the ward supper trays for November and December. So if you are able to do that, there's a sign-up sheet, I believe, in the foyer, um, if you could sign that up. Um, our first song this evening is going to be 738. 738. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the Great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of Kings, Hallelujah to the Lamb, Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the Great I Am. This time we'll have our opening prayer. If you like to go ahead and mark your songbooks, the invitation song is going to be 800. 800. Zion's Call. And before Terrence gets up and does his lesson, we will sing 154. 154. Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wanderer, lone and tempest-tossed. No storms can hide that radiance, peaceful beaming, since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible when my heart is broken, when sin and grief have filled my soul with fear. 
Give me the pressure, words by Jesus spoken. Hold a faith lamp to show my Savior near. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining. Should thy shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, lamp of life immortal. Hold up that splendor by the open grave. Show me the light from heaven shining portals. Show me the glory killed in Jordan's wave. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till I shall vanish in eternal day. Good evening. Glad to see you all could make it. Weren't deterred by the, the promises of rain and storms. I always wonder whenever there's weather what it's going to be like. So I'm glad to see everybody make it back out with us this evening. Since we've been studying... Hold on. I'll figure this out in a second. But since we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 for a little while... As we continue reading through it over the next couple of weeks, I wanted to bring our devotional thoughts tonight from the same chapter and maybe stir up our minds before our discussion later on this evening. There we go. And so we took the time to, to study fasting. We set aside some time. We studied fasting. We, we took one lesson and looked just at the Lord's Prayer. And then last week on Sunday morning, we talked a lot about the, the first half of this chapter together. And so tonight we'll talk a little bit about it as a whole. We'll kind of rip a topic from Matthew 6 and sort of springboard from there. So we're going a little bit of a different direction than last week because I want to talk tonight about is spiritual discipline. This concept was kind of thrown around when we studied this chapter. We, we, we mentioned it. We kind of talked about things around it. And this might be a new phrase for you, maybe something you haven't heard about, at least not talked this particular way before. But the idea behind spiritual discipline is, is, is things you can do as a Christian to help you learn and grow spiritually. It's closely tied to the idea of spiritual formation, if you've heard that before. But, but all of the things Jesus mentions in Matthew 6 are, are, spirit, are spiritual disciplines. There are ways of practicing spiritual discipline. So I, I want to talk generally about spiritual discipline for a little bit tonight. And so you can think of these, these activities as almost spiritual workouts. And again, to be clear, that is giving, praying, and fasting that Jesus talks about in the beginning of Matthew 6. And when you physically work out, whether it's lifting weights or running for a certain distance or floor exercises, stretching yoga, whatever your fancy is, you're, you're training your body. You, you do things that are hard. You do things that are challenging intentionally to, to push yourself physically so that by practicing these things, you, you will make your body stronger. I think they say on a muscular level, you actually tear down the muscle so that you can build it back up stronger. And you do this so that you can be better off. Maybe have better stamina, maybe have a healthier heart, have, have stronger physical endurance. People who care a lot about this thing will, will actually have a certain routine, right? Either set outside time every day, either in their week, or so that in the long run, their body will be stronger, will be better. And you may not realize it, but God calls His people to, to work out spiritually, to, to be spiritually disciplined. In Deuteronomy 8, very close after the reciting of the law in Deuteronomy 6, in Deuteronomy 8, 5, He says, Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in His ways and by fearing Him. So right after the, the, the praising of the law, the giving of the law, the reciting of the law in Deuteronomy, God says His people can expect discipline. They should be disciplined. And so I want to just mention a few verses and look at a few verses that talk about spiritual discipline tonight. This is from Hebrews 12.10. 
the, the Hebrews writer is speaking of God, and he says he disciplines us for our own good that we may share his holiness. For in the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So Hebrews talks about discipline being good, about being perhaps a little challenging, but yielding the fruit of righteousness. We've seen over and over as we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and Matthew 6, Jesus talking over and over about this call to be righteous. And so understand that when we, we talk about discipline in this context, it's, it's not necessarily the, the, the pain or the struggle we sometimes think of when we hear discipline. Sometimes if, if we're going through a particularly rough period in our life or we're dealing with either incredible trials or we're dealing with personal tragedy, we might say that, that God is disciplining us. And while that's true, that, that's not quite the same kind of meaning behind discipline that, I wanna, that we're talking about tonight. That is almost a hardening process. But the discipline we're talking to is more of a training, a practice, a regular thing. It's not just that sometimes things are good and sometimes it feels like God is disciplining you, but this is, this is something that is a part of a routine that you do on a regular basis. And so the Hebrews writer talks about discipline as it might be challenging. It might be uncomfortable for a little while as you work to improve yourself. And I bring this particular verse up because I think so often as we kind of mentioned this morning, but so often when things get uncomfortable for us, we run. Our instinct is to withdraw. Our instinct is to, to walk away or even run away from something that makes us uncomfortable. But as we talked about this morning, we cannot just ignore the parts of Scripture that make us uncomfortable. In this case, when you are growing spiritually, there might be some discomfort. Believe it or not, I remember being kind of a young boy and going through growing pains. I don't know what they did because I did not grow, but I do remember the pains. <laughs> In the joints and in the shins and the, you know, there's a reason the expression growing pains is what it is. They're not called growing fun. It hurts. Growth hurts. And so when we're growing spiritually, there might be some discomfort. I, I had a professor at uh, Heritage, he over, over and over, he talked about the expression of stretching yourself. And he said, whatever you come here to do, whether your goal is to be a youth minister, whether your goal is to be a missionary, whether your goal is to be a pulpit preacher, he said, I encourage you to stretch yourself and not just pigeonhole and say, like, well, I'm good at this one thing, but I, I want you to grow and to stretch yourself so that you can become good at a variety of things. And he said that because, well, stretching hurts. Being stretched hurts a little bit. In the context of what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 6, the, the first time you pray, if it's, if it's the first time you've prayed in a while, it might feel a little awkward. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to somebody who, or when asked about why they're discouraged in prayer, like, well, I just haven't done it in a long time. And I, I just don't know what to say. I don't know how to talk to God. And we'll, and we'll talk about some difficulties in prayer later on in our, in our class, in our discussion. But growth is uncomfortable. Fasting. Boy, fasting would certainly probably make us uncomfortable for the first time. But Jesus says to do so produces righteousness. It produces a spirit that is dedicated to God. This isn't exactly something Jesus mentions in Matthew 6, but I mean a, a massive and obvious spiritual discipline would be Bible reading, Bible study. Bible study can certainly feel uncomfortable. It can be difficult when we're growing and learning in that department. When you're, when you're trying to read, but you're not sure what's going on, you're, you're trying to understand it, it's, just, it's hard to wrap your brain around it. That's why one of my main goals in our adult Bible class is, is to equip us with tools that we can take home so that when we study these passages, we can, we can understand them just a little bit clearer. That it can be that much easier to study on your own going forward. But sometimes there's a sharp learning curve as it comes to interpreting and understanding God's Word. It can certainly be intimidating to do so for the first time. And so Hebrews 12.10 says us we can expect some discomfort, some challenges, when we first take on spiritual disciplines. I believe I've told this story before, but, but every so often in, in chapel service at Heritage, you know, if you go to chapel service at a Christian college, you have the prayer, somebody leads a song, somebody reads some scripture, and somebody offers a little five-minute, ten-minute, thirty-minute sometimes, devotional thought, lunches afterwards, so they get a little antsy at about twenty minutes. But one, every so often, our, our, our dean of students would go up there and he'd say, okay, guys, it's new chapel week. And what that means is students who have never done it before get up there and they lead a prayer, they lead a song, they read scripture, they give a devotional thought that have never done it before. And every time before he get up there, he says the same thing. Travis would get up there and he'd say, growth is hard. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to watch. It's uncomfortable to listen to. It's uncomfortable to be a part of. 
I'm sure all of us have been a part of the growth process of maybe somebody leading a song for the first time or, or even preaching for the first time. In a similar vein, I'm very grateful to our congregation, to the, to the men and sort of the leadership for their commitment to our fourth Sunday night service and, and expanding that not just to youth but to, to anyone who wants to become more comfortable in, in leading songs or reading scripture in front of the congregation. For us as Christians, as, as the individual, growth is painful. And so it's important for us as a, as a community, as a church, to embrace that, to assist those who are committed to growing and developing themselves in ways that they just might not have before. But it's important just on that individual level that as Christians we understand sometimes it's just part of the process. Paul speaks regularly of spiritual discipline in his letters to the churches. In 1 Corinthians 9, a passage we referenced this morning in our Bible class, from 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, a very famous passage, Paul says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we a imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul says here that, that discipline is not just good, it's not just beneficial, but it's actually necessary in a Christian walk. And he speaks especially from the position of, of one who's a teacher, one who's going to preach, one who is going to take any sort of leadership. He says, I especially must be disciplined. It's necessary that we discipline ourselves. Paul says he does so for self-control, that he might run to compete, that he might run to obtain that prize. We spoke this morning about smart investing or investing in the way that Jesus calls us to working for the right rewards certainly heaven is a prize worth practicing for worth training for worth disciplining ourselves for one last scripture I want to share this is from 1st Timothy 4 1st Timothy 4 beginning in verse 6 if you put these things before the brothers you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, but especially of those who believe. It's a little bit of a longer section there, but I want us to see the, 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 the progress of, of Paul's message. He's, he's writing to, to young Timothy, a protege in ministry, and he's been giving him lots of doctrinal information in 1 Timothy 1 through, really chapter 1 through chapter 3. And in classic preacher faction, in about chapter 4, he says, he makes it sound like he's going to conclude, and then the book goes on for about three more chapters. But he says, by these things, he's referring to that doctrine, that, that teaching that he's been imparting to Timothy. And he says, set these things before the brothers, and you will be a good servant, trained in the words of the faith. Part of discipline is, is understanding our faith. It's not only a faith that exists through, through feelings or through our emotions, although we certainly talk all about time about our love for God and the love God has for us, but, but faith is not just felt, it's actually something that's understood in our mind. It's something that must be taught, something that must be passed on, and so it's something that must be grasped and understood on our part. It's important to teach others, and discipline is a part of that teaching and that understanding process. There's a reason classes assign homework, Right? They want you to go home, and, and I promise you if you're in school, it's not just busy work, because some of it might be that does happen. I won't lie. I've had teachers that do that. But, but the goal is you go home. You, you practice it yourself. You work out a little bit of issues yourself. You grapple with it. You struggle with it. You, you go through that pain of sort of figuring it out, and you come out better for it. Spiritual discipline, reading, fasting, giving, praying, we can, we can almost view those as spiritual homework. If you've ever been in, in school, especially at, say, higher education, once you get past about the middle of high school, they will straight up tell you, if this is the only work you do, you will fail. If you do no work outside of class, you will fail. 
I've mentioned before that if the only time we're reading our Bible is in congregational settings, well, I'm not going to assign pass-fail to the idea of salvation. But I can tell you it's not something I want to get a 71 on. <laughs> I want to be more than a 70, but man, I don't know if I want to shoot for a, a C on something like that. And so we can view spiritual discipline as almost a sort of homework in this process. It's the way that God expects us to, to go home, to, to figure it out on our own, to, yes, maybe struggle with it a little bit, to maybe call a friend, to ask somebody, hey, Dad, I'm struggling with this, do you understand this? Maybe get some help. But he expects us to do a little bit on our own, a little bit of homework, a little bit of discipline. I also read that passage for another, another line in there. It's down in verse 10. When he says, For to this end we toil and strive. Paul is telling Timothy that yes, we train. Yes, we, we run for that heavenly prize. We run to obtain the crown. We, we train that we might be disciplined. That we might be controlled. That we might be righteous. That we might be spiritually mature. But we have one mission for which we toil and strive. We have one goal. One end. One mission that is, is over everything else. A hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. And you know what Paul says about belief, right? Romans 10, 14. How then are they to call on Him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in Him in whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? Paul knew he had one mission. One mission that superseded everything else in his life, and that was preach the gospel. In season and out of season. The gospel to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. 2 Timothy 4.2 the gospel, which is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew and then the Greek, Romans 1.16. Paul knew that above all things, he was called to preach the gospel. And so he said, I discipline myself for this one end that we toil and strive so that I might be fit to preach the gospel. Obedience to the gospel is repentance, it is confession, and it is baptism. If you're with us this evening and you've not made this decision, but you're ready, we can talk with you and that can change tonight. If this invitation is for you, won't you come while we stand and while we sing? While the light from the throne shines for you and me, let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us heed the call of Every below there is work to do, and our strength cometh from above. As we labor and wait, we must all be true. Let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is At this time, we have set aside time to take part of the Lord's Supper for those who have not had that opportunity. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day that you've blessed us with and thankful for all the many blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day. Most of all, Heavenly Father, we're thankful for Jesus and the great sacrifice that He made for giving His life upon that cruel cross for our sins. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this bread, which to Christians is Christ's body as He did die on that cross for our sins. 
we pray that those who partake will do so in a well-pleasing manner. In Christ's name, amen. Father, we continue our thanks for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which to Christians represents Christ's blood that was really poured out on that cross. We pray that those who uh, partake will also do in a pleasing manner. In Christ's name, amen. This now concludes the formal part of our worship service. I will now turn it over to Brother Terrence for our Bible class. Right. There we go. That's a little better. So, good to see everybody again. Normally, we would have a discussion that was really specific to our lesson this morning, but I wanted to open this up to a little bit, to kind of at least the whole chapter of, Ma of uh, Matthew 6. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. We'll be camping out there for the most part tonight. We've got a couple of the verses I I'll reference. But I, I know it's been a while since we've had the discussion. We've had a couple different formats on Sunday night and things we've gone through. And so I, I wanted to provide some time for... If you had them, if you had questions, because we, we've been talking about this, like I said, for a few weeks now, and I, I really look forward to, to this time because especially for, for texts such as this that are very rich that you might have a thousand questions on, I want to open up the floor for those who might have them or, or something that maybe you had a question about something that got mentioned, something that didn't get addressed. And so maybe I'll just start with sort of a, a generic question as to what parts of, of chapter 6 or even the, the Sermon on the Mount so far have you found particularly either challenging to deal with, to wrestle with, or, or maybe just convicting from, from where you're at in your own life right now? Thank you. I was not fishing for compliments, but I'll take it. <laughs> um, no, this. Yeah. Really yeah. Kind of um, right. Yeah. And if, if you weren't here, it was. I believe it was last week, last Sunday night. Last weekend was a bit of a blur, but I believe it was last Sunday night. We talked specifically about fasting and looked at some examples. And yeah, you bring up a great point. That, a, And I even kind of said a little bit of disclaimer. There's a lot of Christian interpretations on this. This isn't something to me. It's a salvation issue that you got to agree with me or not on it. But I would tell you that nobody else reads Matthew 6 and says, well, praying was just for that time, or that giving to the poor was just for that time. And, and something I didn't get to talk about a whole lot, and we'll, we'll kind of, the way I have this structured is I have some notes really on each section of Matthew 6, so if we get all the way to, to money and treasure like we talked about this morning, we'll get there. Uh, if not, we'll kind of do this in two parts, because next week's lesson in the morning will be from uh, not being anxious, and we'll talk in that last, really that last third of Matthew 6 will be our sermon next Sunday morning. So next week, Sunday night, will be really the same thing as tonight. We'll kind of just keep going through some of our extra notes and discussion points for Matthew 6. So I, I say that to say if we get to verse 19 specifically, cool. If not, it's not a big deal. We'll get to it next week as well. But I appreciate you mentioned that about fasting because one of the many things I did not get to get to in our lesson on fasting is just when you, just if you read really verse 1 through about verse 18... And there's a reason we dealt with the Lord's Prayer separately because he gives that example prayer so it makes it seem like his section on prayer is longer than the other two. 
But really, Jesus' sermon or his speaking format is, is the exact same structure, verse 1 through 4, and then verse 5 through, well, 5 through 9, and then verse 16 through 18, all kind of mimic each other. Like, he, he really is saying sort of the same things about each of these disciplines. And so it's so funny to me that we would come to one conclusion with one, but one conclusion with the other two, when Jesus is pretty clearly saying the same thing about each of them. And so, yeah, I, I think it is important for us to at least consider that uh, that is a spiritual discipline that he, he says is out there that is an option. Yes. Yes. In fact, we looked at an example verse that was in 1 Corinthians, and I don't remember which one it was off the top of my head. Um, it's very common. I mean, in fact, so I don't, I don't talk too much about what we would call the denominational world does about X, Y, or Z, but there are several things that, for example, the Catholic Church does that they do that I said we could, be, we could think about mimicking, not because they do it, but because we have history that, well, the disciples did it. And the disciples did it, and it's a practice that continues today in some, uh, I'll say, traditions. But we have evidence, for example, that, yes, the early disciples fasted. It makes sense. They were Jewish. Fasting was not new to them at all. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to prayer. But another example was... Go absolutely, yeah. It is absolutely a practice that is just as valid as other things. Now, the trick is, and we looked at this uh, last week, is... We see the, the New Testament church fast twice. There's two examples of it, Acts 13 and Acts 14. But there's not a command to regularly fast on like a routine or a season. And so I think sometimes it's hard for us to say, so, so when? May, March, June, all the summer, all the spring, certain holy days, between Christmas and New Year, what's the deal? Well, he doesn't really command a time period. But we do see the biblical example of the early church when it was coming to decision-making time. Like I said, those two major passages are Acts 13 and 14, and uh, we, we can get there. We can look there now. I mean, we're talking about it. We might as well, I guess, right? We'll jump around here a little bit if that's what our questions are about. So in Acts 13 and 14, you know, I said this Sunday night. I'll say it again. This is, I think the way I put it in my notes is that this is not something I'm good at. But if I'm being honest, it was this is not something I've done. <laughs> You can probably tell. And, and you, you joked, you said it's becoming popular again. I was like, boy, we live in very different circles. <laughs> but uh, so I have I have heard of the uh, the inter what they call intermittent fasting becoming more of a thing. And so that that, that is a good point. Um, so so two things. You say can you fast something that's not food? Absolutely. There's practices of that, and that's what I was gonna, that's what I was getting with my whole tangent was yes, if, if you know people who celebrate Lent, one of the reasons they do that is because, yes, in the, the early church, there was evidence of fasting not just from food, but also of certain practices or certain things. Um, like I said, the best example is that passage in, in 1 Corinthians where Paul says, um, I know the quote, but I don't know the, the verse, chapter and verse, but he says, do not deprive one another except for an important, agreed upon time, so that you can devote yourself to uh, prayer. And 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Thank you, Van. So that would be one very notable example of, of the practice of fasting being applied to a certain kind of abstaining from certain activity with the goal. I'll take fasting. I'll take fasting. <laughs> yeah, you, make a, you make a very good point, which I'll say, just like anything else we talk about, if you're on a diet, if you're on medicine, if you're on something, I'm not telling you to go start a fast tomorrow. Please, please do not do that. We want you to see Jesus. We don't want it to be soon. Um, so. Yeah. Right. And so the, the purpose of it was, like, I, I'm going to be so, so devoted in my spiritual commitment to God that I'm going to show God that not only do I say that I put the spiritual things first, but I'm going to say God does not even come before my human biological desire to eat. And that, to me, is like the ultimate, the ultimate statement of nothing between me and God, right? 
I'm going to eat on it in just another uh, point of clarity. When we studied fasting last week, we also mentioned the traditional Jewish fast was actually not a complete abstention from food, although that was common. But when you see somebody said they fasted for 40 days, they're, they're not a miracle of science. They didn't just, you know, wither away and die into day 41. Um, it was fasting and you did not eat until a single meal after the sun went down. And so again, if you know people who are I can't think of the word for Orthodox, but the Orthodox Jew, if you know people who are Muslim, Muslims share a lot of their, their holy book has a lot of similarities to our old law. That's why they practice it. They kind of copied some stuff. Um, but Sorry. Um, but if you know of people who do that, that's why. Because the traditional Jewish fast was you would not eat until after the sun went down. And so when you see people fasting for 40 days, well, they were still eating. But it's saying, even my innermost, basic, most human desire is not going to come between me and God. And you know what? If this is what I can do to, to, to clear my mind, and I'll tell you something, if I made a modern parallel to that, I think in, in a weird way, because I was thinking about this lesson still a lot, in a weird way I think our abundance of food, A, makes it hard to understand fasting, but probably makes it to where food doesn't really come between us and God. Like, I, I've never had breakfast instead of coming to church. <laughs> like, I've, like, I've never had to go hunt. Well, okay, some people have. I've never had to go hunt and kill my meal for the day and that keep me from going to church. Um, what I would maybe suggest, if you're looking for a modern fast that is abstention from certain practices, is try a, a social media fast for 40 days. You talk about coffee making you irritable or, uh, you know, caffeine... Because I would say, if I, if I was to pick something that was not food, but a, a modern parallel practice that I would say, for the most of us, it probably gets in the way of us focusing on God, uh, that's, that's going to be up there on the medal stand for me. Um, so I'm glad you bring that up, because the, the goal was, was, A, like I said, it's, this, it's the number one thing of saying, like, I'm, I'm going to deny myself in every single way, every desire of the flesh, and put God first. And so I'm going to eat on this kind of schedule, because that's, just because I can. Like, just, just to do it. And so, if I was to say something that is actually such a huge part of our lives, that it can sometimes get in the way of focusing on God, I think that would probably be a decent place to start. Absolutely. You always see prayer and fasting. Fasting and prayer. Prayer and fasting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Right, which... For some of us, depending on how, how difficult the thing is that we're moving, it can be pretty hard not to be, you know, why are you so grumpy? I haven't eaten anything, that's why. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree. <laughs> right. I would say it's one of those things that I would say is a great example of something that we're like, I don't know what to do with this, so I'm just going to go over here and keep reading. <laughs> you know? Because it, it is kind of odd. It, it's odd to us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there you go, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, since, since we're talking about I'll go ahead and just reference, because I, I think I referenced the chapters last week, but I didn't say specifically. It was in Acts chapter 13 and 14, I believe. And it was, there was two times. One was when they were in some point of conflict, and when they were trying to resolve it, 
they fasted to sort of prepare for the Word of God, which is what we said was the uh, was the Old Testament pretext, was the Old Testament proof. Um, one is from Acts 14, verse 23. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, so I was at a... At the, at the congregation I was at before this one, I was with a church that was struggling to get elders. We were working on trying to get elders. We were, we were wanting elders. And, and I have a, a close minister friend of mine there. He's a preacher at the Rogersville Church of Christ. And he said, well, are you praying about it? And I was pretty convicted. So I was like, well, I, I want it to happen. But I, I, don't, I don't know if that's really made my prayer. And he said, man, if you want elders, you ought to be praying daily for that. And that kind of shook me because... As we, like I said, this is another one of those, just, I had not heard it, as you said, Mike, I had not heard it taught a lot. And for the last year, um, our, our elder search and just that process has weighed on me heavily in a lot of ways. And I read this and I'm like, it never once in this entire year has ever occurred to me to, to go through any period of fasting or anything even remotely resembling fasting when that's the most explicit example of the early church fasting. And it says, for a period of time, they devoted themselves to prayer and fasting. They committed them them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And that is the... I know there's another one. If someone else finds it, feel free to holler it out. But I know there's another one right around here that I'm missing. Oh, well, okay. should ask you guys first. 13 what? Ah, 13, 13 2. If you didn't hear them, 13 2. It's, yes, it's when Paul and Barnabas are sent off because they're, they're committing them to a mission. They're, they're sending them off really like missionaries. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And so that's particularly interesting because it talks about in the context of worship. So I don't know if that was all day on a Sunday or what exactly that means. It also talks about fasting as like a very active activity, you know, as something that, again, like we've said, where instead of eating, you're not just not eating, you're not just so busy that you don't have time to eat, but it actually says, no, 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 they're, rather than setting aside time for a meal, they're setting aside time to focus on God, to pray to God, to expect an answer back from God on this decision that they're wrestling with, that they're facing. So... Yeah, I, I would say so. In these particular instances, it seems limited to probably a day, um, which could be uh, what we talked about. There's, there's uh, really the three different kinds of fasting. We talked about this last week. The number one was the traditional Jewish fast, which was eating after the sun goes down. The second was no food for, for that day, and those are typically the fasts that we see for a couple days, a few days. You know, you, you're, you're not going three months without food. But then the other one, and this was more seen in the prophets, was no food, no water, nothing until God kind of moved them in the direction they were looking for. But uh, yes, you bring up a good point. That is, in this case, it is probably a, a very time-limited fast, so not a 40-day thing. But I'll tell you, I know just, um, again, thinking about abstaining from other practices or even if we look at the example of Jesus in Matthew 4 where he, where he gets away from everybody. He goes in the wilderness to, to, to pray and to fast and he's preparing himself for this ministry. I, I know many ministers who take a, a week, some of them longer, and they say, this is where I prep all my stuff for the year. You know, they almost take a, a sabbatical if you want to call it that. Some guys up to a month, I'm not advertising that, don't worry. But, and they go off and like they don't, they don't really talk to people, they don't really go with their whole family. It's not a trip or a cruise. They go off kind of in isolation for like a week or several weeks and they say, this is what I'm going to prepare because they, much like the, the prophets, like Jesus did, like the church did, they say, I, I need this to, to isolate myself and prepare God to act, to prepare for God to respond, to prepare for God to answer uh, the challenge that I'm facing. These are good questions. These are good questions. That's almost certainly the traditional Jewish fast, which was not eating during the day, but having a meal after the sun went down. Um, not a scientist, but I'd, if the water is Gatorade and a protein shake, you might make it 40 days without any food. But I think, unless there's something miraculous going on there, which it does not hint that there is, uh, that's probably the tradition, because he's also not the first person to fast for 40 days. Uh, fasting for 40 days is a pretty, I almost want to say, standard time for the prophets. And that is almost certainly 
the, the no food or drink until after the sun goes down. And when the sun goes down, you have kind of a, um, a one big meal, and that's when you eat and you drink all your water. And in many cases, it's one sitting when the sun goes down, and then that's it. Other times, it's kind of uh, all bets are off after the sun goes down, so it's different. But even then, I don't imagine too many of us are eating dinner at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in July, <laughs> right? Depending on the time of year, that's, that's late. So, probably the traditional Jew is fast when Jesus was in the wilderness. Well, cool. That's why we're doing this. I'm glad we had some questions and thoughts on that. Um, talking about prayer, I wanted to share some of these thoughts. So, in preparing for my lesson, and I've asked this question before, I put out on social media, I said, prayer is fill in the blank, prayer is hard for you because. And I just put a blank there. And just some of the responses I got, uh, some of them were kind of, uh, I, would say I would say superficial, uh, not in that they're shallow, but you'll see what I mean. They, they said, I get distracted or I don't make time, was a very common one. And I think of that, you know, that's where I think the, even though Jesus is talking about going into your closet to be quiet and to not be showy about your prayer, I think if you're someone who gets distracted, maybe, maybe just start with finding some time alone. And I know depending on kids, spouse, families, that's, that's not the easiest thing. If you're anything like me, sometimes after a particularly long day, you pull in the driveway and you just kind of sit there for two minutes. That's about the only time you get alone all day. It's a great time to, to, to pray a little bit. But uh, people say, I get distracted, I don't have time, I don't know how to pray. I think we kind of address that in our study of Matthew 6. But some other ones, just to, and this is just maybe, this could resonate with you, or uh, I, I don't want to think about the things I know to pray about. Somebody said that. I thought that was very convicting. They said, I, don't, I know I should pray about these things, but I don't really want to dwell on the things I'm doing wrong. I don't want to dwell, take time. To, man, I know I need God's help in this area. And, and they bring up the great point that lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. That's a great part of that. Not that, in, in, I can't remember if we talked about this specifically or not, but as James talks about, not that God tempts us, but, but the word there is actually uh, almost testing, like a, um, not a trial by fire, but like I'm going through, I'm preparing for a large test or a particularly large uh, trial. <laughs> He's got a lot of comments. He doesn't know how to put into words, I guess. But, they said, I don't want to think about the things I know that I need to pray about. And I would say, yeah, praying about things you feel convicted on, on things you're still struggling with. I think sometimes we get kind of uncertain, like, well, I can't, can't talk to God about my sin. And I got news for you. God is God. <laughs> There's no secrets with God. It, so Exactly, yes. He said he already knows it. And, and that was something, one of the... One of the many categorizations I saw of this whole chapter was how to be real. Right? Because Jesus is saying, don't do it fake. Don't be a phony. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be showy. Don't do it for them. Do it just to do it for God. And, and I would argue one of the biggest problems in Christianity today, or at least with the church today, is, is the, the reputation of hypocrisy. I'm sure you've dealt with it. I can tell you I deal with it. I hate it, but it, it, it is out there. That we do things to be seen, that we do things to be showy, that we do things to, to put ourselves as sort of looking down on other people. And I heard somebody else, another commenter, say this from this passage about the church is, we want to hide our sin but publicize our holiness. We want to hide our sin and publicize our holiness, and Jesus says we should be doing the complete opposite. That we should be open and able and comfortable confessing our sins to one another, as the Bible says many, many, many times. But we should be private about our holiness. But we should be able to, to, and comfortable to say, yes, I struggle with this. And yes, God, I need your help with this. Yes, I, I am praying that you will deliver me from the temptation that I know I still struggle with. And that's okay. First Corinthians 13, 8.
Are you talking about the food offered to idols in 1 Corinthians 8? I th my understanding is 1 Corinthians 8 is... Re mm, I think it's really talking about food being offered to idols in that particular... But I, I, would be inter I will have to study on that later. I, I will have to study on that a little bit more. But I believe that's a reference to when Peter has the vision in Acts 9 and Acts 10 about the Jewish dietary restrictions. And you, you could make the argument that fasting falls under dietary restrictions, but I don't, I, I'm not sure I understand that particular chapter that way. Um, but in terms of just being real about sin, we can be real about sin in our prayer. Um, another comment somebody made in terms of I, it, prayer is hard for me because they said it feels selfish to ask God for stuff. And that one I did kind of resonate with because I think, I think that's where maybe our mentality on prayer is probably sometimes we tend to think of prayer as like a wish list. <laughs> Here are the things I would like from Santa. I mean God. Well, that's not really what prayer is supposed to be. And uh, I would say maybe that perhaps represents a little bit of a misunderstanding or a, a, a not complete understanding about prayer is by all means express your wants and desires for God but you can talk to God and not just ask Him for stuff. Any, any parents in here got grown kids? <laughs> Do you love when the only time your kids call you or when they ask for stuff? <laughs> Probably not, right? That's no, nobody likes that. So it's okay to talk to God. I mean, by all means, express your wishes and your desires to God, but if that's the only time you talk to God, then yeah, maybe we need to reevaluate a little bit. Sure. I'm not sure I would see a problem with, but I'm not sure I understand your question. Why? Why do you ask? Because I would say there's many scriptural evidences of praying for the same thing over and over. I see where you're coming from, and I could probably give a fuller answer, sort of off the record or after class but I would say just from a scriptural standpoint um, we're going through the prophets on Sunday morning right now a little repetitive in the prayers <laughs> just a little bit there's a little repetition in the prayer there so I, I would say it's perfectly I don't think it demonstrates a lack of faith at all um, but, but then you get into you know if uh, I think it's very subjective but I would say I don't see a scriptural uh, example against it at all um, kind of on that note I wanted to read just a few verses because I talked, I've referenced this several times um, since we're talking about prayer I want to read this from Lamentations 3 and then I'll probably go ahead and close us in a word of prayer but I wanted to read Lamentations 3 because when we talk about honest prayer you guys have heard me mention several times the, the honesty of the prayer of Lamentations and Lamentations is five chapters in chapter 1 and 2 Jeremiah is just completely uh, grieving. He's very open about his emotions. He's angry. He's upset. He's tearful. He's bearing his soul to God. And then in chapter 4 and chapter 5, he begins to proclaim God's holiness and God's righteousness. And I want us to read chapter, a few verses of chapter 3 because we see his transition right here in the middle of Lamentations chapter 3. And so this is kind of the crux, the heart of the book. And I want to read a few verses from Lamentations chapter 3. And then maybe open it up for a little bit extra comments or any other thoughts, but then afterward we'll go ahead and close in prayer. From Lamentations 3, and we'll read the first few verses, and then I'll skip down at a certain point. Lamentations chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. And Jeremiah is speaking about God here. He has driven me and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stones. He has made my paths crooked. And I want to pause there for a second. 
because if we looked at this, if we broke this down theologically, and we'll talk about the problem of doing that when we study the, the poets in a few months, but if we broke this down theologically, we're like, well, Jeremiah, God doesn't not hear your prayer. Well, Jeremiah, God isn't the one who makes you dwell in darkness. No, 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 no. But I want you to understand that, that when, how many of us, when someone is grieving and they say something and they cry out or they don't understand, that is not really the time for corrective theology. And in case you didn't know that, I have not learned a lot in my few years of ministry, but one thing I have learned is that when someone is going through the hardest thing they've ever experienced in their life, that is rarely, sometimes depending, but that is rarely the time to be like, well, that's not really how God works. You don't need to think that way. Jeremiah is expressing what's on his heart. And he's, he's not necessarily saying that this is how you should view God or how God does work, but this is what I mean by honest prayer. He said, yeah, it feels like I can't get out. It feels like I have no escape. He's made my chains heavy, though I cry and call for help. He shuts out my prayer. You ever feel like God has shut out your prayer? I can sit up here in the pulpit all day long and tell you, well, that's not how God works. Of course God hears prayer. But sometimes it feels like God shuts out prayer. Skip down. to verse 19. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. And from there on, we see Jeremiah, his, his tone totally changes. His tone totally changes. And we see him work through the grief and work through his suffering and work through his stuff. Because he, and he's talking to God the whole time. And so prayer is not always what we think it is. I'm glad we got to talk a lot about fasting. Uh, I thought that would be, uh, I don't want to say controversial, but maybe exciting topic. I had several people, as you guys very very kindly mentioned, that I've been in the church 75 years, and I've never heard a lesson on fasting. I'm like, me neither. So I was very hard to prepare, so I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> well, we'll go ahead and close in a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Oh. Oh, there's a quick uh, men's meeting after services for a few minutes. Uh, come straight down to the hallway and we will meet. I was like, no I don't, but thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Let's go ahead and pray. God, we are so thankful that, that you are a God whose steadfast love never ceases. We know that we sin and we know that your mercies never come to an end. We are so grateful that, that, that you have allowed us a means to grow closer to you. You've given us our word to study that we might know you. I pray right now for our congregation as we, as we go out to, to try and do your will, God, that we seek your ways in all of our lives and all of our little paths and our decisions and our struggles and our, and our ups and our downs and the decisions that we will face in the coming weeks and the coming months. I pray that we will be able to give those to you, God, and understand that your will will be done. We thank you always for your son who died on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whew.
I'm gonna turn off the lights. Yeah, you got this. I believe in you. Yeah, that's one. No, other way. Down. You got this. You got this. There we go. I'll count it. Yeah.
No. Hey. Why can't you just wait? No. Uh. Whoa. 